Alrighty, let's start. So welcome to Gaze of Our Lives. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. Okay. And you answer them, okay? Okay. Um, so what's your name? Where were you born? And what's your sexual identity? Uh, my name is Zuhan. I am born in Singapore. Um, I guess I would identify as gay. I have to like, what the f*** am I doing in this space? <laughs> so, when did you know you were gay? When did I know I was gay? Um, I guess in secondary school, I went to a male, all, I, I guess all boys school, uh, secondary school. Uh, and it was there that I realised that I was interested or attracted to classmates in a way or well, I found them attractive uh, at that time it was also very difficult to gauge because being in an all boys school right when your hormones are charging you're not sure whether it's just a phase or it's part of something that is uh, just puberty or changing over the over those few years and you didn't have any other person from an opposite gender that you could probably play out those feelings on in that kind of compressed, intense school environment. So at that time, I found myself slowly starting to get interested in other classmates. Uh, found them really attractive. Uh, had crushes on several uh, cute guys. And from there, it was when I sus started to suspect that I was probably gay. Uh, and over the years, it came through. And I started my first relationship when I was in high school. I see that you have a an interesting t-shirt. Well, best. can you tell us a bit more about your singlet? The, basically how this shirt came about is that um, I was studying in the States uh, and that was also the same time when the whole marriage equality thing was happening and American Apparel came out with this t-shirt and started selling it uh, and that was a f probably in a few years after 2009, which was the first edition of Pink Dot. And every year when I go to Pink Dot, I was always struggling to find pink stuff to wear. So when I was studying and I saw this shirt, I didn't know it was only for marriage equality. So I decided to buy it. And then I came back to Singapore and I started wearing it at Pink Dot. Then the first year I wore it, then the second year I wore it again. Then the third year I decided that I'm going to keep wearing this shirt for all Pink Dots if I do attend. And the reason why I'm wearing it today for the interview is because it's just one week after Pink Dot. Unfortunately, I wasn't in Pink Dot this. I wasn't in Singapore this year, so uh, for Pink Dot, so I couldn't wear this shirt. So in a way, this is like compensating for it. But I did tell friends a couple of years ago that I'm gonna keep wearing this shirt at Pink Dot until you know 377A is repealed, and I don't have to keep wearing this shirt. It doesn't mean anything. So I'm gonna keep wearing this shirt until it stops meaning something. So I guess you know we hear what you said, and you know it sounded like you have a lot of knowledge on queer politics and you know LGBT issues of in the Singapore context and of course globally you know I'm interested to know what do you do for a living? What I do for a living? Um, the basic answer would be I teach for a living. Um, I'm an art teacher. Uh, I also do an artistic practice on the side which is focused on performance uh, but that doesn't probably give me enough money to make a living so I would specific to your question I survive and I sustain myself based on my teaching practice and I in the larger sense I also make uh, projects and artworks and performances uh, and I'm about to become a student again and that's my other mode of sustaining myself I'm going to pursue my PhD specifically in performance studies so more to the boring stuff um, you want to know like what does a day in a life for you look like you know what what, what does your week, week day look like and what does your weekend look like um because i'm a freelance uh, teacher when the semester is on when the school semester is on then i'll have a couple of days during the weekdays when i go into art school and i teach and those are my regular hours so they can range from 9 a.m to like 1 p.m or maybe 1 p.m to 6 p.m uh, so I would work my weekday schedules around that. Uh, as an artist, it's also important to always go out and see work by other peers. Uh, so most of the weekends will be taken up by going to attend theatre performances, 
supporting peers in their work, exhibition openings. Uh, it might sound like it's all hunky dory and like she she champagne, but actually it's not. Uh, it's part of the job scope is to network and to know people and to continue this transmission of information and knowledge. And these panels, discussion, conferences, uh, events, performances are one way and one mode of ensuring that this information gets circulated. Yeah. So it's professional practice in a way. Yeah. What do you do for like chilling out and uh, yeah, yeah, I succumb to the pressure of being a gay person in Singapore uh, by going <laughs> to the gym, even though I hate it, uh, it's tedious, uh, but I'm trying to derive pleasure out of it. Uh, it's just a maintenance of your physical self, and after a while it becomes a way of like just disciplining your body and your mind. Uh, but another thing, physical practice that I really enjoy is actually going to yoga and I've been slightly trying to be more active in terms of my yoga practice and it's just very calming and meditative to be able to walk into a space uh, and go through a flow and after that be able to lie there and just let go of your worries for the day so I like that and I enjoy that a lot so those two things are mainly what I'm doing now I'm also trying to learn cycling so the thing is that I fell off a bike when I was really young uh, and I didn't dare to go back on the bike again. So I'm moving to San Francisco for my studies and I have to find a way to get around in California. So I'm starting to learn to bike. Hopefully the intention is that eventually when I go over, I'll be able to bike on the streets. In the institution that you teach in, are you out in the institution? And if you're out, how is it like being out? Hmm, so I'm... The flexible thing and the frustrating thing is that I've always been freelance. So they never really had to hire me for a serious long-term contract. In that sense, I have more flexibility to be in terms of my own practice, but also the content of what I do. Uh, most of the institutions that hire me would know because I'm quite, I foreground my sexuality and it also comes out in the work. Uh, I, I make work, I make f short films about my sexual identity. Uh, I did an uh, installation about uh, queer memory and archiving. So it's quite strong and clear in my portfolio that I'm going to be a gay artist and I'm not ashamed about being a gay artist or performing my identity. Uh, so in that sense, it's almost like they don't really ask you when they hire you. <laughs> they sort of know it and I know it and then I get hired and then I just teach. In general, I don't know, what is your experience being out and gay at work, like as in human to human interaction? Like with your students, with your fellow, you know, educators and uh, the fortunate and unfortunate thing, I always start my sentence like that. Uh, the fortunate and unfortunate thing is that I have very little engagement with fellow tutors in a way. Probably like only one or two individuals because I, I'm a freelancer, I go in, I teach a class and I leave. Uh, so maybe that's one way of isolating myself from such politics in the workroom. Uh, for students, and I've seen it several times over the past few years as a teacher and educator, is this palpable sense of relief when they see someone who is comfortable with their sexuality and not afraid to put it into their work. Uh, it's this sense of like, finally there's someone here who is able to talk to me about such issues and I've been wanting to talk to someone about these issues. Uh, unfortunately, not all the times I'm able to meet the expectations of what they desire out of a conversation with me uh, because of laws like 377A in place, because of my responsibility as an educator and adhering to a sort of kind of code uh, of conduct. Um, yeah, but sometimes it doesn't even really need to be said just the physical presence of somebody who is modeling a way of being and going through life as a queer individual present in the same space with them uh, is enough 
or I hope would suffice. Yeah. Tell us your coming out story. My coming out story, yeah. I think in Asian families, the focus is not so much on the coming out itself, but the what happens after the coming out. And, you know, the damage control after coming out, for me, is a uh, much more important thing that we have to build awareness and pay attention to. Uh, the Eurocentric narrative is that coming out is an event. It's a one-time thing. Uh, you proclaim your identity and authenticity to your parents, and after that, it's like, hooray, I'm free from the shackles of the homosexual closet. Uh, in the Asian context, I think it has to be a durational performance. Uh, it has to be beyond an event. It's not a singularity. It's something that is consistent and it takes time. So the coming out process for me is a slow build up of releasing nuggets of information to my parents to prepare them until like one moment then you release the information but beyond that and something that I don't even do very well that perhaps that's my regret because at that time I was fed a lot of like western narratives of what it means to come out and it's like seeking true authentic self and I didn't really follow up on what it means to them. because you have to understand you know they're from a generation that watch TV and Channel 8 drama and there's no representation of queer people on screen within their conscious daily engagement, there are no gay people. So they don't, don't even know what it means. To them, if you say that you're gay, it means that you're going to get HIV and you're going to die. Uh, because that's the media representation that has been fed to them. So how do you, as a son or a daughter, actually educate them as much as you're educating yourself? Uh, and they don't have Netflix, they don't watch. So they don't really have all these resources. How do you provide these resources to them so that they are able to understand that there's so much more to being gay than having sex and yeah, getting STIs. Uh, yeah. So how do you educate them uh, with the information that you have? And it's also a gradual process of revealing nuggets of information uh, even after the event of coming out itself. So I would say my official coming out event was when I was probably 17 or 18 and my mom actually asked me the question and I actually made a documentary on it. It's called Autopsy. Okay. Uh, it's a conversation I had with my mom. Uh, it's a very old film, like 2007. Uh, but that was like the reenactment process. Uh, the actual conversation actually took place uh, around when I was 17 or 18. And uh, she asked the question and I told myself that if she was ready to ask the question, she must be ready to hear the answer. Yeah, so I was honest with her and I mean Asian families is always down to that singular question of is my child happy? And if my child is happy, and my mom is slightly Buddhist in terms of her thinking. So it's like, you know, emptiness is form, form is emptiness, and se ji si kong, kong ji si se. So it's like everything is, you know, it's like able to come and go, and it's about living with tang xia, whatever is present. Um, so in that case, the most important thing for her was whether I was happy, and as long as I was happy, uh, then that's the most important thing that matters. Yeah. And I've heard it in many, many coming out cases. Yeah. If you could go back in time, what would you say to your younger self who's in the closet? I don't know what sort of advice I would be able to give uh, in the closet to Han. Because it's not about really advice, it's about representation and letting the the person that I was know that he wasn't the only person in the world that is facing this problem. Um, so it's nothing that can be said. If anything, I would try to introduce like nuggets of information <laughs> to that little boy to let him know that it's okay and there are more of us in this world than you can ever possibly imagine. 
So thank you Zan for uh, being a guest on Days of Our Lives and uh, you know we hope to see you in another episode hopefully um, in different contexts and uh, all the best with your new adventure in San Francisco. Thank you. And hope to see you again very soon. And cut. Cut, cut. Huh, that's it. That's okay. It. What about like